Welcome to From the Inside Out with Pastor Tim Molter of Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls in Minnesota. We're glad you could join us today. Sit tight, get your Bible, and get ready to get in the Word with us as we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book through the Word of God. Well, with that, let's turn in our Bibles to Leviticus chapter 1. The title of our study is The Burnt Offering. Now, before we get into chapter 1, I thought it would be wise to kind of give you an overview of this book as we begin uh, looking at this book together. We are now in this time frame after where the Israelites were in bondage in Egypt for about 400 years. And God has provided a way out of Egypt through parting the Red Sea. And they've come to Mount Sinai, received the law, the Ten Commandments. And now they've received instructions of building the tabernacle. They've completed that. And so we pick up now uh, at a time frame where, unfortunately, there's a part of Egypt that is still in the people of God. God brought them out of Egypt, but there's a part of Egypt still in them. And in Egypt, their view of God became really distorted. And so the book of Leviticus is going to kind of deal with that uh, and provide instruction and laws to guide a sinful yet redeemed people in the relationship with a holy God. The primary theme of this book is on the need for personal holiness in response to a holy God. Chapters 1 through 7 uh, are going to outline the offerings required by both the congregation and the priesthood. Chapters 8 through 10 describe the consecration of Aaron and his sons of the tribe of Levi in the priesthood. Chapter 11 through 16 are the prescriptions for various times of uncleanness and how to become clean and pure. And the final 10 chapters are God's guidelines to his people for practical holiness. And that's chapter 17 through chapter 27. So again, the theme of this book is really holiness and God's holiness and, and it's kind of a hard concept for us to think about. And the closest illustration I could think of was thinking about the sun, uh, which is like, what, 93 million miles away. And yet, if we were close to the sun and we got really close to it, what would happen to us? We'd burn, right? We'd burn up and die, right? You get that close. And the truth is, that's how it would be if we got that close to God on our own, right? We, we wouldn't last very long. And yet, we know that if we stand in the sunlight outside, we get warmed by the power and the rays of light that come from the sun, right? We can feel that warmth. So too, we cannot be holy apart from God because God is holy and pure and perfect. So the only way that we can have personal holiness is by getting close to God, follow him as he leads us, and then we can radiate God's truth and love to those around us. We can begin to... to show others that they too can experience a relationship with God, that they can be set apart unto the Lord. So the sacrifices that are in this book, are there's a couple of different ones, and one of them is a way just to say thank you to God for his provision. There's other sacrifices that are to say you're sorry to God for your sin. And we'll see that as we get into Leviticus, there's a system that's very foreign to us, because this is under a covenant that has been set aside. And we see that because in the New Testament, we're told that God established a better covenant with us through Jesus Christ. So the old covenant involved sacrifice of animals, yet it could never make anything perfect. And we study this in depth in the book of Hebrews. Um, and we saw that the, all this could really do was point us to a sacrifice that was yet to be offered whereby we could be brought into a full perfection before the Lord. And we know that was Jesus Christ, right? The perfect sacrifice. And, and we'll see as we take a look at this chapter that some of these sacrifices had to be offered again and again and again, where Christ was offered once and for all. No other sacrifices need to be made. He made the perfect sacrifice for us for all of eternity. And so with that, let's take a look at the first couple verses here. 
in this chapter, we'll take a look at these domesticated animals that were brought for an offering. Leviticus chapter 1, picking up in verse 1. Now the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle of meeting, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the livestock, of the herd, and of the flock. We'll pause there. Again, we pick up with the Israelites coming out of Egypt. And so the herds and the flocks they have, they would have gotten from escaping out of Egypt and plundering the Egyptians. And so these, these animals were very valuable to them. And they are still camped out around Mount Sinai. In fact, they'll remain there for the majority of this book at Mount Sinai. At this point, the tabernacle has been completed. The sacrificial, the sacrificial system can now be implemented, uh, and that sacrifice can take place. Yet, when we look at the Bible in total, we, we know that sacrifices have already occurred. In fact, if you studied with us through the book of Genesis, you saw this. When we uh, looked at uh, Genesis chapter 3, we saw Adam and Eve sin against God. And God slaughtered an animal and covered them with animal skins. There was some sort of animal sacrifice that took place there. I can't say, thus saith the Lord, but I kind of believe it was a lamb. Uh, doesn't tell us what animal it was, but that's kind of where I would lean. It would make sense with the typology. So there was an animal that was sacrificed there. You get to Genesis chapter 4, Cain and Abel. They knew that they were required to bring an offering, a sacrifice unto the Lord. One brought it in faith, trusting this is what the Lord requires. I'm going to bring it in obedience. The other kind of did his own thing, and God wasn't very pleased with that. Uh, you can get to Genesis chapter 8 with Noah, offering a sacrifice unto the Lord as well. So because the sacrifice was already known to Israel, these instructions to the priests are really a clarification of the foundation that was already known to Israel through the traditions of their fathers of these sacrifices. But notice here that this offering, it says, was to be of the livestock, of the herd, and of the flock. That means to be an Israelite worshiper, this could not be a wild animal that you caught. Uh, this was something that was domesticated. This was part of your own flock. And so they could only bring this domesticated livestock from their herds. And it shows that we need to offer something. It shows that this was an offering to God that cost them something. It had to be something personal. And I'll be honest, I've uh, caught fish, and maybe you have, or maybe you've skinned a deer, and you know there's a process involved in all of that, and um, some kind of other animal, what it's like. I remember in California growing up in, in a forest ranch, and we had all kinds of animals on our farm, and I remember my brother and I, it was our responsibility to take care of the rabbits, to raise them, and then to kill them, and then prepare them for supper. And uh, you learn a lot as a kid doing those kind of things about life and death and uh, sanitation as well. And, uh, and one of the things I realized in that process was it's very different when you have a domesticated animal versus a wild animal. And I tell you because these tame domesticated animals are very different in the way that they really weren't trying to get away. A wild animal is going to flee. And so these offerings were, were from the livestock, meaning it cost these people something of value. It, and it was also part of their livelihood. So they were getting, giving up part of their livelihood as a sacrifice unto the Lord. So these sacrifices were of more value to the people and thus, they were of more value to the Lord because it was more meaningful. It was something that involved a cost. So we see that this is kind of the premise of this chapter, that they're going to be bringing these offerings unto the Lord. So let's take a look at verse 3 through verse 9, and we'll see they bring this bowl and offering, which is a, an atonement offering. And so we'll take a look at that here in verse 3 through verse 9. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. Then he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. 
He shall kill the bull before the Lord and the priests. Aaron's son shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood all around the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And he shall skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire on the altar and lay the wood in order on the fire. Then the priest, Aaron's son, shall lay the parts, the head, the fat, in order on the wood that is on the fire upon the altar. But he shall wash its entrails, its legs with water, and the priest shall burn on all the altar a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. We'll pause there. Now, notice with me here in verse 3 that the sacrifice or offering that you brought before the Lord was voluntary. It was of man's own conscious will. God was not forcing the people to bring this offering. This was a voluntary offering. And as I was thinking about that, it reminded me that man exercised his own free will when he left left that fellowship with God. Man chose that in the Garden of Eden to, to leave that relationship with God. And so God does not force us back to love him. God didn't force Adam and Eve to love them in the Garden of Eden as well. And the truth is God does not force us to serve him. God does not force you to give to him. It has to be something that's voluntary of your own will. And so the things that I just listed are things we get to do, not things we have to do. And that's a big distinction I think we need to make uh, mention because there are people that will say, I have to read my Bible, I have to go to church, I have to tithe, I have to pray. No, you get to do those things. No one's going to force you to do those things, right? Unlike other religions where it's convert or die, you don't get that in Christianity, right? You get to make that free will decision on on following the Lord Jesus Christ and, and choosing to follow him of your own will. And also notice here in verse 4, we see these sacrifices. There's this laying of your hand upon the head of the sacrifice before the slaying of the animal. And as you would lay your hand on the the animal as it was going to be sacrificed, there was this transference of your guilt, your shame, your sin upon that animal. What you were saying was this animal is going to be taking my place. I deserve death for my sin. I'm transferring my guilt to my my sin onto this animal. They're going to die in my place. So this animal would take your place and it was a complete offering unto the Lord, completely burned up by the fire, a complete and total consecration unto the Lord. And you notice here in verse 4, it uses this word atonement. This would be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. The Hebrew word here, and that's what the Old Testament is written in, is is mainly in Hebrew. In the book of Daniel, there's a little bit of Aramaic, and the New Testament is Greek, uh, also known as Koine Greek. And so here in the Hebrew, the the word is kapar. It's actually where we get our English word cover. And so this atonement was a covering for the sins of the people. In the Old Testament, it was impossible for the blood and bulls and goats to put away our sin. They they couldn't put them away. All they could do was provide a covering for those sins. So the guilt of the person, the sin of the person was covered, but it was never really put away with. And so the word atonement in the Old Testament is actually a covering for our sins so that we can have that relationship with the Lord. In the New Testament, we know through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our sins are put away with once and for all through his sacrifice. And that was really the point of this sacrifice in the Old Testament, was to look forward to a better sacrifice yet to come. And so in the New Testament, when we see the word atonement, it really uh, is is translated where we get our word koinonia from. It's it's this word fellowship. It's this word at one with, or you can think of atonement as at one mint. We're at one with God the Father through the Son. We have oneness now with God through his sacrifice for us. And how grateful we should be for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That this old relationship is no longer valid. We don't have to offer animals as sacrifices. But we have this new covenant found in Jesus Christ. That he is that perfect sacrifice once and for all. And so God created man for the purpose of fellowship. But again, that was broken early in the Garden of Eden. And Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and many of us have probably thought 
if we were there, we wouldn't do it, but I, I probably would guess we would do the same thing, right? Uh, be honest, we, we're just as guilty as they are. And so we've inherited that sin nature, and we rebel against God. And so in the entrance of sin, there came a broken fellowship with God. Man was alienated from God. But God sought to restore fellowship to mankind. And so God wanted this fellowship, and something had to be done about sin. And thus God established this Old Testament system of sacrifices where the animal became that substitute for your sins. And it looked forward to the day where another sacrifice would be slain for you. So again, this animal, it was sacrificed, your sin was covered, and you could have fellowship with God. That is until you sinned again. Then you had to offer another sacrifice. And then you sinned again, you had to offer another sacrifice. You can see this system would just keep going and going and going and going. And if you sinned a lot, you'd have to do a lot of sacrifices. And so this covenant really failed to bring man into a full and complete relationship with God. What it did do was point forward to the day where the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, would come and be that perfect lamb without blemish, without spot, who would lay down his life for us, become our sin offering. In fact, those are John the Baptist's words in, in his gospel. He says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Speaking of Jesus. So Jesus is that perfect sacrifice for us. And you notice that the sacrifice here um, was to be perfect. It was to be a male without blemish. That points us to Jesus Christ, right? The male without blemish, the perfect sacrifice for us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19 says, We are redeemed, not with corruptible things such as silver and gold from our vain manner of living, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, who was slain as a lamb without spot or blemish. So as we study these sacrifices, as we take a look at these, we need to keep in our mind that these are pointing us to Jesus Christ. These are pointing us to him and his sacrifice for us, becoming that perfect, unblemished sacrifice for our sins. So we see that this atonement sacrifice points us to our Lord and Savior. Well, next here in verse 10 through verse 17, we'll take a look at the flock and the bird offerings, and we'll see those point us to our Lord as well. Leviticus chapter 1, picking up in verse 10. If his offering is of the flocks, of the sheep, or of the goats, as a bird sacrifice, he shall bring a male without blemish. He shall kill it on the north side of the altar before the Lord, and the priest Aaron's sons shall sprinkle its blood all around the altar, and shall cut it into its pieces with its head and its fat, and the priest shall lay them in order on the wood that is up on the fire upon the altar. But he shall wash the entrails and legs with water, and the priest shall bring it all and burn it on the altar. It's a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. Verse 14. And if the burnt sacrifice of his offering to the Lord is of birds, then he shall bring his offering of turtle doves or young pigeons. The priest shall bring it to the altar, rain off its head and burn it on the altar. Its blood shall be drained out at the side of the altar. And it sh he shall remove its uh, crop with its feathers and cast it beside the altar on the east side into the place for ashes. Then he shall split it as it weans, but shall not divide it completely. And the priest shall burn it on the altar, on the wood that is on the fire. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. Now, we saw with the, the offering of the bull, and we see now of the sheep or the goats or the turtle doves or the pigeons, an offering of consecration it would ultimately be consumed by the fire. And it's pointing to this reality that if I really want to consecrate myself to the Lord, it needs to be a complete consecration, a complete surrender to the Lord. And so this was a way to signify this desire by bringing this animal to the priest, laying your hand upon the head of the animal before it was to be slain. And we see the priest would take the blood and apply it on the altar, most likely on the horns of the altar that we were 
told in the book of Exodus that they would do. And then this would completely be a, a burnt offering consumed by the fire. And we, we've seen a few times here in this chapter, it says that this whole thing was to be consumed on the altar as a sweet-smelling savor unto the Lord. As I was thinking of that, it reminded me, sometimes we have the, this neat smell of barbecued beef, and uh, maybe you've got to experience that this summer. As the smoke arises upward and ascends, uh, that smoke begins to carry, and, uh, and here we see this was a sweet-smelling savor unto the Lord. It reminds me when we first started our home Bible study, we were over uh, at uh, Grotto Lake Adams Park, and we were in this little home, and it was right across the park from where Burger King was. And there were times where you could smell them putting on the meat, and that smoke would just carry over the lake, and you'd begin to think, man, that smells really good. I'm going to fire up the grill and get some meat going. Um, and now here we are next to Domino's, and I don't know if you've noticed, sometimes after service, there's a, a waft in the air of a fresh baked pizza, and you're like, man, that smells really good. And, and there's something about that, this aroma that we get from these offerings unto the Lord. And I was thinking about that. It reminded me of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15 and 16, and it says this, For we are to God the sweet aroma of Christ among those being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we're an odor of death and demise. To the other, a fragrance that brings life. Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, was reminding them that as Christ's ambassadors and representatives, there are those that are going to see this life of obedience to the Lord, and it's going to be attractive to them. They're going to see this aroma that's leading towards life. They're going to see that there's a peace and a joy that we have, a hope that we have that they desperately need and want. Others are going to be against us. They're not going to be our best friends. They're not going to like us. And, and it's going to be something that displeases them. And so we need to keep that in our mind. Yet as I was thinking about this, I think the best aroma for us today is from a church that's helping reach the lost with the gospel message, being obedient to our Lord Jesus Christ being a light in our community. This too is uh, an aroma unto the Lord that's pleasing to him. And so these Old Testament sacrifices were pleasing to God, not only because the smell ascended, but also because it was done according to his way. You see, these sacrifices were, were carried out exactly the way that God told them to carry it out. And you see, mankind's always trying to do his own thing to get to heaven. In fact, we see this continually today that people make their own way, so to speak, in their mind that they can get to heaven however they desire to get to heaven. And yet that doesn't work. The Bible tells us there's a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death. Jesus told us very clearly in, in the Gospel of John that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. So there's one way to get to heaven, and it's through our Lord Jesus Christ. If there were many ways to get to heaven, why would Jesus come? We wouldn't need him if, if there, we could get to heaven another way. But there isn't any other way. In fact, that's why Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane prayed to his Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me, this cup of wrath and suffering he was about to experience. But there was no other way. Because Jesus was that perfect sacrifice for your sins and for mine. And so we see that the truth is that this shows that there was an order to the sacrifice that God wanted, that we could have fellowship with him. And, and this prescription, this command for this offering had to be respected. If, if in the Old Testament they tried to bring an offering to God and they did it their own way, as we saw Cain did, it w wouldn't work out very well. The same is true for us if we try and uh, bring an offering to the Lord and do our own thing, so to speak, it's, it's not going to work out. You couldn't just offer this offering uh, any way that you wanted unto the Lord. You had to bring your offering the way that God wanted you to. And it all comes back again to this idea of holiness. There's a holy God, and he's told us how we can have a relationship with him. And we need to follow that order that he's laid out for us. 
And so there's salvation in no other name other than Jesus Christ. He, he's the only way that we can have this right relationship with the Father. So again, all this points us to our Lord. And in closing, we see that God takes holiness very seriously. And I believe we should as well. We're seeing this trend in what I would say the post-modern emergent church age where it's based upon experience other than truth. That I can come and worship God and as long as I have this experience, then it's a valid form of worship. But was it what God wanted? That's the question we should be asking is, Lord, what do you want? How can I please you? What's the offering of worship that you desire from us? And so there are those that really create God in their own image. And yet we should worship the way God describes for us in his word, right? To worship in spirit and in truth. Worship because we have a relationship with him and we love him and then worship in truth. That we're not there and putting on a show. We're not there because there's something in our heart that we don't want to deal with. And God would say, I'd rather you deal with that first because I know what's going on and you just need to be real and confess it to me. And so I think it would be wise for us to know his word, and God's utter holiness, his transcendent splendor, his unapproachable light, which I think are foreign concepts to many Christians today. The Bible tells us we're called to walk in the light. We're to put away the darknesses of sin. We're to live our life so that we may be pleasing in his sight. And I think, you know, another thing we could take away from this chapter is praise the Lord is that because of Jesus' death, on his behalf, that we have salvation. And, and as I was reading, again, just this chapter, just reminding me that Am I there? Can you hear me? All right. Interesting. Anyways, I was reading this chapter it reminded me that, you know, there's this, this offering of the Lord to put away our sin. And it was a costly sacrifice. You know, it's not something that I would volunteer wanting to do. Uh, it was something that was kind of gruesome, to be honest, to kill this animal in this way. And it was, yet it was a reminder that our sin is gross. And, and the payment for our sin is costly. It involves taking life and, and having this life killed. And that's the truth of what Christ did for us on the cross, that he, he took this punishment for our sins upon the cross. And, and I don't know if you guys have seen the passion of the Christ, and, and I would encourage, you, if you have kids, wait till they get a little bit older. There can be some gruesome parts in that film. And yet, that's just a film. That's Hollywood's portrayal of something that really happened. And it's hard for us to fully comprehend his sacrifice for us. So we see these animal sacrifices in the Old Testament, yet we know we have a better sacrifice through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is that substitute for our sins. Our sins are transferred upon him because we deserve to die for our sins, but he took our place voluntarily. And the reality is all of our dependence is now upon him. It's not based upon what we can do. It's based upon what he has done. And so now we can stand before God without fear because of what Christ has done for us. The Father sees in us the righteousness of Christ. So I hope that we would respond with the desire to give God everything and have this, as we said earlier, this I surrender all attitude realizing that he wants all of us. He wants our heart. He wants every part of us. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word together this morning. We thank you that uh, what the enemy means for evil, you can use for good. We thank you, Lord, that as we take a look at these sacrifices, that it reminds us, it points us to you. It points us, Jesus, to your goodness, your love for us that you were willing to become that sacrifice for us. 
And Lord, while we were yet enemies, living in sin, a life apart from you, you came to this earth, lived a perfect, sinless life, died on the cross where you shed your life's blood for us, was dead in that tomb and rose from the grave because you wanted to rescue us. You wanted fellowship with us. You wanted to forgive us. God, we pray that we would continue to keep that in our minds to realize your love for us and that all that we would do would be in response to your love. And God, we do pray if there be any here this morning or watching online who, who need to make that decision of faith, that they would say, Pastor Tim, pray for me, pray with me. I need to get right with God. And if that's you here this morning and, and you need to make that decision, I simply want to lead you in a prayer where you surrender your life to the one who loves you, made you, and knows you. And if that's you this morning, I simply want to encourage you to repeat this prayer after me and mean it in your heart. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I realize that you love me. That, Jesus, you died on the cross for my sins. That you shed your blood for me that you were buried and rose from the grave. God, I ask that you'd forgive me of my sins. Take away my guilt and my shame. Come into my heart and my life today and be my Savior and my Lord and become my closest friend. God, I thank you for forgiving me I thank you for loving me. I pray from this day forward, I will follow you with all that I am. I love you. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to From the Inside Out with Pastor Tim Molter of Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls in Minnesota. We're glad you could join us today as we study God's Word, cover to cover, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. Would you like to partner with us? Consider becoming a giver with us to support this ministry. Please visit ccfergusfalls.com giving. Find out more about this ministry and all of our ministries. Check out ccfergusfalls.com. May God bless you as you study His Word with us and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Life to you I give shout from the inside out.